most churches were not built for short people, these pulpits. I feel like all you can see is a head. So I've got a little stool back here to make me appear a little taller and you can see me a little more. Um, our scripture lesson today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Um, there are so many trivia games, game shows and games out there. Um, when I was a teenager, the big one was Trivial Pursuit, the board game. These days they have on the app a Trivia Crack and um, Quiz Up. The TV shows are Jeopardy, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader, which I'm not smarter than a fifth grader. I don't know about any of you. But... Um, Trivia games are a lot of fun, and any time I'm playing one, I always want my, to be on my husband's team, or I want him in the room to give me the answers. He is a font of useless information. <laughs> he knows so many facts and dates and any, about anything that I just don't know where it comes from, but if you, like on uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, phone a friend, you want to phone my husband. He knows trivia like nobody's business. Trivial Pursuit uh, is a fun game. All the trivia games are fun. They test our knowledge in a variety of areas from science to popular culture to uh, geography, which I'm terrible at because it's always changing. Um, the, but I named my uh, sermon Trivial Pursuit what really matters. Trivia, trivial I want to define, is defined as something of very little importance or value, insignificant, and a pursuit means um, to chase, to hunt, or to go on a quest. So what is trivial pursuit for us today? It's chasing after an unimportant thing. It's chasing after something that's not very important. That being said, the things that are important to us, whether they are trivial or not, what's important to us is what we pursue in life. At the end of the day, the real question is not um, what we like or dislike. It's not about um, what is important or what is trivial. The real question is whether or not the things we do and pursue in life have meaning, have real value. What are you pursuing in life? What do you hope to achieve with your life? Does it really matter? Or is it trivial? The things we seek out and search after in life can be endless. Consumer analysis have concluded that the average person's emotions, I mean ambitions boil down to uh, four things that people chase after. Money, food, sex, and power. To a great extent, that is right. All we have to do is look at what's being advertised in magazines, on the television shows, or on your Facebook app, what pops up. Um, it is clear, crystal clear, what our culture pursues. We tend to buy um, what we see and hear the most about, but it is all trivial. You see, as Christians, we are not an average people. We are the family of God. We are called to walk by faith and not by sight. So I submit to you today that nothing matters in life more than the pursuit of God. The reality is that when we pursue God, God will give us the desires of our hearts. So what does it mean to pursue God? We're gonna to look today at two sisters who were trying their best to pursue God. Their story is well known by Christians, Mary and Martha. They're often interpreted in many different ways. Today's I wanna today I wanna take a look, a closer look at their personalities and how they each sought God. The truth in relationships often is that if we know what makes us tick and what makes the person next to us tick, 
we can get along better, if we understand where we are coming from, where our loved ones are coming from, their history, their personalities, we can relate a little bit better, have more compassion. There's more compassion, more empathy, and more kindness when we try to understand each other. There's so much information out there about personality types and tests, and on Facebook you can do all sorts of little quizzes that will tell you what your personality type or um, different things. Um, and psychologists will often have you do different, and some employers, different personality inventories. There's one I want to look at today um, and, and apply it to Mary and Martha and their story and see what it has to teach us. The personality profile is the Berkman inventory, um, and he says there's four basic personality types. I'm going to outline them. See if you can see yourself in any of these or your loved one. First of all, the first category personality, he says, is the action-oriented doer. This person is action-oriented. They're strong-willed. They want to get things done. Um, they, they're almost like a bulldozer. They have an agenda. They're going to get it done. You better get it out of the way. The second personality is the detailed planner. This person plans the work and then works the plan. The detailed planner's personality is precisely what the name implies. One who thinks through everything in great detail, who plans ahead, who wants everything done neatly and orderly and systematically. The detailed planner will do really well until somebody comes along and messes up the plan. The third personality type um, is the enthusiastic salesperson. This person has no plan. The enthusiastic salesperson is a people person who operates on personality, has the strong ability to wow people and win them over and sell them on his or her ideas and dreams. The fourth personality Dr. Berkman suggests is uh, called the artistic poetic philosopher. This person is so soulful, more tuned in to beauty, reverence, and awe, the artistic poet, poetic philosopher is creative. They enjoy quiet, pensive moments. They enjoy being alone, um, and they tune in to the wonders of the universe and can experience God on a really deep level. Now, Dr. Berkman has um, developed an interesting way to help illustrate these personality types so that we can recognize them quickly. He says, um, he says imagine that you have nine cats, in a house, and your task is to get the cats outside of the house, how would you do it? The action-oriented doer, well, obviously they would open the door and say, scat, get out, and the cats better get out. That's the action-oriented doer. The detailed planner, on the other hand, would number the cats one through nine. They would make a little tag with the ribbon color-coded with the number on it. Then they would cut holes in the doors and expect the first cat to go out number one, number two to go out number two door, number three. That's the detailed planner. The enthusiastic salesperson would say, no problem, piece of cake, I can handle this. They would get a glass of warm milk, a little bowl, and some cat food, open the door and say, come on out, it's better out here. Meanwhile, the artistic poetic philosopher would say, what in the world am I doing worrying about cats? So do you find yourself in there somewhere? Yeah, I hope you found yourself somewhere in there. The point of this personality profile, and for us today, is that we are different. We are all created different. And when we recognize, understand, and respect, and celebrate our differences, we can get along a lot better. It's one of the key themes in Paul's letter to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians. He says some are prophets, some are teachers, some are action-oriented, while others are pensive and thoughtful. Some are poetic and some are autocratic. Some are loud and some are quiet. We're all different, and that's okay. That's how God made us. Now, with this as a backdrop for our thinking, let's look at this passage in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus comes to visit the home of Mary and Martha. Put on your amateur psychologist hat and see if you can analyze Mary and Martha and figure out what their personality styles are. Let's remember the story. All morning long, there had been a bustle and excitement in this home in Bethany. Jesus was coming for dinner. Now, if you knew God was coming to dinner for your house, wouldn't you just go 
have to clean everything, right? Get all your best dishes out. Get it, if you're a Martha, maybe. Um, you would just be excited, and Martha was. She was so excited. Since daybreak, she had been sweeping and scrubbing and dusting, checking all the dishes, making sure there were no chips. She had chips in the china. She had been running around, getting all the ingredients for her food. Um, and every moment was precious. She had it all lined out. She's a detailed planner. Can you tell? That was Martha. And then Jesus comes in, and look what happens. Mary whisks in to take over as hostess. She welcomes Jesus and the disciples warmly, ushers them into the living room, and sits down and starts to visit and listen to what Jesus was teaching. The master was on his way to Jerusalem and on his way to the cross, and he begins to talk to his friends, and they listen, especially Mary, She's positioned herself at the feet of Jesus, drinking in how every word he has to say. Meanwhile, Martha's out in the kitchen, slaving away, preparing the meal, polishing the silverware, checking all the details. But here's the problem. All the while that Martha was working, she was seething inside. She was angry. Her mind was pursuing trivial matters. Her indignation mounts. She gets more and more frustrated, more and more stressed out. Where is Mary? Why isn't she in here helping me? Who does she think she is, sitting in there with the men, listening to Jesus? Surely Jesus can see the injustice. And finally, unable to contain herself any longer, her, her resentment erupts. She bursts out of the kitchen, and she makes a scene. Have you ever been a part of somebody who makes a scene? Yeah. Sometimes we make the scene and sometimes we witness. Well, Martha makes a scene here. She cries, look at this, Lord. I'm having to do all this work. Don't you care that my sister Mary's making me do it all by myself? Can't you, you get on to her now. You tell her to get in the kitchen and help me. But Jesus says to her, Martha, Martha, don't be so worried and troubled about so many things. Relax. Lighten up. One thing is needful, and Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken from her. End of story. Now look at these personality types. Of course, Mary is the poetic philosopher, the artistic. She was interested in the deep spiritual things. Martha is the detailed planner. She has planned this event to the nth degree, but she had not planned on Mary not helping her. Yet here in the story, Jesus rebukes Martha. It's a gentle rebuke, but nevertheless, he did speak words that compared Martha unfavorably to her less practical sister. And the question that explodes out of the story is why? Why? That's how God made Martha, to be a detailed planner, to get everything done. The church needs detailed planners. They need artistic philosophers. They need doers. They need... Um, Oh, I forgot the third one. Uh, the enthusiastic salesperson. Most preachers are the enthusiastic salesperson trying to sell, uh, tell you about God and this great thing that's happened. We need everybody. So why does God rebuke, re, why does Jesus rebuke Martha for being Martha? Not for a moment should we imagine that Jesus was unappreciative of Martha's intense desire for a job well done. If, uh, if Mary had been the one who was resentful and seething, I think he would have rebuked Mary. You see, Jesus was not concerned about what Mary was doing outwardly, but about what she was feeling inwardly. His concern was for Mary, I mean, for Martha's heart, for herself. He was concerned about her attitudes, how perceptive she wa he was, how quickly he could size things up. In a moment, with a brief glance, he could penetrate right down to the heart of the matter with Martha. There's no criticism of a detailed planner in this story, no criticism of Martha for being Martha. We all need Marthas in our lives. But when Jesus looked at Martha that day in that emotional scene, he saw some red flags, some warning signs, some destructive attitudes that she was having in her heart that would harm herself and others. Jesus loved her. They were good friends. He visited her house more than once. They were good friends. And that day he saw in her some hurtful attitudes that were working in her like spiritual poisons, petty attitudes which can devastate and destroy the soul. So I want us to look at some of these attitudes that in Martha that he was 
rebuking in her and see if maybe they're, if we have them in our hearts. When Jesus looked at Martha that day, he saw deep inside of her the dangerous attitude of resentment. Martha was resenting Mary. In my, in my opinion, there's nothing more destructive to our spiritual lives than resentment. It can absolutely ruin your life. And Jesus knew it. It concerned him to see resentment in Martha. In the Greek language, there are two words for anger. There is thumos, which is a kind of quick anger that quickly blazes up and just as quickly dies down. The second kind of anger in the Greek language is orge, and it is a seething anger, a brooding anger, an anger that, um, that is long-lived. It is the anger of a person who um, nurses his or her wrath to keep it warm. It is an anger that festers and will not die. This orge um, is what resentment is made of, a brooding, seething anger. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus repeatedly warns of this danger of resentment, and he says, in effect, Re beware of resentment. It's dangerous. And we see it here again in the story of Mary and Martha. First, notice the words that were used to describe Martha. There were three words, distracted, anxious, troubled. That's what resentment does to you. But even more, her resentment cut her off. Her resentment not cut her off not only from her sister Mary, but from her Lord, Jesus. From Jesus. The same thing happened to the elder in the story of the prodigal son. He got mad at the father, and it cut him off from his brother and from the father. That's what resentment does. That's how it affects us. It's why it's so dangerous. It separates us from people, and it separates us from God. In this passage, uh, what is Jesus saying? Simply this. Beware of the dangerous attitude of resentment. It can devastate your soul. The second attitude that Jesus, I think, addresses is narrowness. Martha is done in by her narrow perspective. Martha thinks her way is the only way, and she wants to force her way on Mary. Martha's view has become so narrow that she can't see any other way to receive the master but her way. She is blind to the miracle of uniqueness. She forgets that we're all different, that we're all individuals, and each of us has a unique relationship with our Lord. How often have I seen this narrow attitude cause problems theologically as well? People think that their religious experience is the only valid one, and they try to force their way on everybody that they meet. They don't understand that God is big enough to relate to each of us differently, individually, uniquely. God meets us in our lives where we are, and he comes to us in a way that I can understand. He came to me but it may be different for how he came to you because you're a totally different person than I am. Some years ago in another church, there was a party given to recognize a married couple who had been working with the youth program, and I'll call them Betty and Bill. They had very different personalities. They were married, but they were different as night and day as often as married couples are. Betty was vivacious, outgoing, gregarious, affectionate. She was a hugger. Um, if you gave her a ribbon, she would jump up and down and squeal with the light and run around and show everybody. Bill, on the other hand, was the opposite. He was quiet, reserved, a little bit shy. He was stable and balanced. If you gave him a Mercedes and a trip to Hawaii, all he would do is quietly say, thank you. Now, on this particular night, Betty and Bill were given a surprise party. The young people jumped out from their hiding places, yelled surprise, and again gave them a beautiful present. It was a beautiful plaque. Betty read the plaque aloud, uh, was so excited, hugged each of the people in the room, ran around, and Bill waited quietly. And when she was through, he said, I want to thank you also. But that's not the end of the story. Betty turned on Bill. She got mad at him, and she made a scene. We talked about making a scene. She made a scene. Look at you, Bill. You don't appreciate anything, she said. If you did, you would like it. You would do just like I do. But you see, Bill couldn't act that way. If he squealed and ran around excited, everybody would know it was fake. That wasn't Bill's personality. You wanted to say, Betty, leave him alone. Don't force your way on him. Let him do it his way. Let him be Bill. Now, I have to tell you, I'm probably more like Betty, more effusive and out there and hugging um, and 
but I also know that Bill's quiet thank you is just as genuine and just as real and just as valid. In this episode, in this scripture with Mary and Martha, Jesus is saying, beware of the attitude of narrowness. It can devastate your soul. We're all unique. We all come to Jesus in our own way. Third and finally, there is unkindness. Don't miss this now. When will we ever learn? Martha tried to make herself look good by making Mary look bad. And it boomeranged on her. And she came out, in this instant, as the unattractive one. Ultimately, it happens every time. Our harsh, condemning judgments on others can come back to haunt us. When we are unkind to others, we are the ones that end up looking bad. Sometimes there was, some time ago there was an article on marriage, and there's tons of articles, but there was one line that jumped out at me, and it said um, one of the greatest statements of about a marriage relationship. It said, if you are ever in a situation where you have to choose between either making yourself look good or make your, making your mate look good, always choose to make your mate look good rather than yourself. Jesus, I think, would have liked that counsel. He would have enhanced it by saying, always make other people look good rather than yourself. That kind of kindness boomerangs. It comes back to bless us. I know a woman who lives like that, always bragging on others, always encouraging others, always making others look good rather than herself. And the fascinating thing is that everybody who knows her loves her and respects her and appreciates her, and, and admires her because of her unwavering kindness. The point is clear. When we send, what we send out comes back. If we send out unkindness, it comes back to haunt us. If we send out grace, love, and compassion, it can come back to bless us. In the Mary and Martha story, Jesus is teaching us a great lesson about our inner attitudes, and he's saying, beware of resentment, of narrowness, beware of unkindness. Choose instead the way of grace, of love, compassion. We are all unique. Whoa. Hello. We are all unique children of God with our own unique personalities. And I don't think Jesus was saying Mary's uh, poetic philosopher personality was better than Martha's detailed planning. He wasn't looking at their personalities. He was looking at the attitudes of their heart, whether they were ready to receive Jesus, to listen to what he had to say, or worried about what the other one was doing. I am so thankful that God loves me just as I am because I am a mess. I'm a mess, but he loves me, and he gives me grace, and he loves you and gives you grace just as you are, and he accepts you, but he challenges you and me like he challenged Martha to look at the attitudes of our hearts, to look at how we're treating others, and how we're approaching him. Let us live lives filled with grace and hope and love and kindness. Let us pray. God, I thank you so much that you love us just as we are, but I thank you that you don't leave us as we are. You challenge us to grow into the new creation that Christ can make us. Help us to be aware of the attitudes of our hearts, to live and to choose lives of kindness and love. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand and join us in singing our hymn of response? Come thou fount, come.